Welcome back to Human Monsters. As always, we are eternally grateful for the ongoing support that you show us. I know we are not everyone's cup of tea, but if I look at the numbers, we have a steadfast audience and dedicated listenership for which we are eternally grateful. Since we are an independent podcast, we would really appreciate it if you took a minute or two and give us a thumbs up, a like, a comment, or even recommend and share our little passion project. It might mean a couple of clicks for you, but to us, it will mean the world. About a week ago, a woman from Bali in South Africa drowned her four-year-old daughter in a bucket of water. Her identity remains unknown because she has another child. Her motive for the murder was that the child was naughty and working on her nerves. In South Africa, everyone was in an uproar, and it's frankly better that she remains unknown, because this is a country that pays little respect to police laws and is more inclined to jungle justice. I agree that there should have been better ways of handling the situation by giving the child to a relative for a while, but it got me thinking about why women kill their children. I recently did an episode about women, or rather teenagers, who never told anyone they were pregnant, and when they gave birth... They killed the infant. As a journalist, we are forced not to judge and just to report, but it's often easier said than done. To many unmarried women, there is a sense of shame and denial that they are pregnant, and they somehow detach themselves from the fetus inside of them. Often there is no support system, and the topic of pregnancy of or childbirth is simply never discussed. Many countries still have strong religious and cultural beliefs and believe that a woman that gives birth out of wedlock is dirty, spoiled for marriage, and a disgrace to the family. There are countries in which honor killings are a way of dealing with the mother of a child who has no legal father. Then there is the problem of women who are not able to provide for their children. To them, watching a child suffer in hunger is worse than infanticide, especially in the third world where rape is a common practice without consequence, and when poverty is so desperate that you can see the bones through a person's skin. It's difficult to play judge and jury when a child is killed. Most countries do not allow abortions, and unless you've walked a mile in someone's shoes, you have no idea what you will do in that situation. As Mike Tyson once said, Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Child homicide is the most extreme form of violence against children and a tragic event with serious effects on families and the community. Approximately 95,000 children are murdered each year globally and the risk of being murdered in childhood is strongly associated with age, gender, and geography. Traditionally, infanticide is often related to economic necessity, the inability to provide for the infant. In the United Kingdom and the United States, older infants are typically killed for reasons related to child abuse, domestic violence, or mental illness. The infanticide is done in the child's best interests, quote-unquote, often happening when a woman is in very difficult circumstances. Nearly 30% of mothers who kill their children also end their lives by suicide. Some try to protect their children from potential sexual abuse by ending the child's life. Today's episode made me doubt my objectivity a considerable amount. 
This is a case so shocking that I could not believe it if it was not for the sources. Let's begin these tragic cases with a woman by the name of Megan Huntsman. Megan did not just kill one of her children. She murdered six of her babies. In 2014, she was charged with the murders. They were part of the Mormon community and very religious. They are described as middle class and not out of the ordinary. Although we don't know much about her approach to faith, she is described as a happy and normal child. She was, however, a very private person and would keep secrets to herself. She was shy and introverted and lacked confidence, which made her a quiet child. Megan did, however, have a close friendship group and would have sleepovers, but she kept herself very private. No one knew what she was thinking or feeling and she would draw into a shell of her own making when people tried to probe her. This personality would follow her into adulthood. This seems to be the case with many women who kill their babies at birth. They were completely normal women with average lives, support structures, and no reason to not just hide the pregnancy, give birth in secret, and then kill the baby. Megan did have one confidant by the name of Darren West. He was older than she was, but all we know is that she was in the same school. Darren was a bit of a bad boy who frequently got into trouble. He was often late for school. Sometimes he did not even show up, and he loved to party, drink and smoke. Megan was attracted to the rebellious side of Darren, and soon the two opposites started a romance. By the time Darren was in college and Megan had just graduated high school, the relationship had become so serious that he proposed to her. In April 1993, the couple got married since Megan was of age. Despite being so close to Darren, Megan kept one major secret from him, and that is that she was pregnant. He was the father of the baby, but for some bizarre reason, she never told him. It might be because she was only 18 years old, but she was married and had her family for support. She managed to carry the baby to full term without anyone knowing. It's true that some women cannot show for a long time, but even at nine months, there had to be questions. She did keep to herself and wore baggy clothes, but Darren must have suspected something. A week before she gave birth, she sprung this monumental news on Darren. A couple of days later, she gave birth on her own in her home in the bathroom. The family finally found out, but what their reactions were, no one knows. Now that there was a little baby daughter in the couple's life, Darren's family gave them one of their homes to live in. Megan found work as a cleaner and a babysitter, and things appeared to be normal again. Darren got a job at a construction company, and the little family carried on as usual. Not long, and I mean only a couple of weeks after she gave birth, Megan fell pregnant again. Once again, she kept the entire pregnancy quiet. No one knew, not even Darren. This time she gave birth at home again, alone. I cannot fathom being a father and coming home and just being given a newborn baby and being told, it's yours. At this time... The first daughter was only a one-year-old little girl, and the newborn baby was also a little girl. Once again, the family helped where they could, 
and for a while, the family of four seemed to have everything under control. It was when the two little girls were about two and three years old that the wheels came off the bus. It seems that Darren's drug demons came to revisit, likely because of all the pressure of the young family. It had now escalated to a dangerous level, and unfortunately, Megan had also picked up the habit and was also now a full-blown drug user. Megan never used to be an alcoholic, but she would have a drink now and again. With Darren, her drug use was suddenly almost all she could think about. It did not take long before a hit of crystal meth here and there became a consuming addiction. Both were spending hundreds of dollars a day on meth, and both eventually lost their jobs. Darren then got the bright idea to not only manufacture meth, but also to sell it from his home. This way, they always had drugs for themselves, even though toddlers were still in the house. Both were not only neglectful of the children, but became aggressive and violent with the children. The couple would also openly fight with each other in front of the children. Megan began to suffer from anxiety and depression, likely because of the vast quantity of drugs she was consuming. Not only did she become paranoid, but her skin started to acquire a sickly hue, and her hair started to fall out. She lost a lot of weight and would look at double her age. It was never confirmed that there was physical violence, but Megan was often seen with black and blue marks on her arms and on her face. It seems that Megan was trapped in an abusive relationship, and in 1996, she fell pregnant again. Once again, she told nobody. This time, she was completely addicted to meth, and she used it for her entire pregnancy. Again, she gave birth on her own, but this time no one found out, perhaps because she was so severely under the influence of drugs, she decided that baby number three should be murdered. She took her thumbs and just began to push down on the baby's neck until the baby was no longer breathing. She then wrapped the little body in towels and then placed it into a rubbish bin bag and tied it up with electrical tape and then she placed the newborn's corpse into a box. She took the box to her garage and hid it amongst the other boxes, such as the boxes where they kept the Christmas decorations, where she knew no one would come to scratch around. She went back into the house, cleaned up the mess in the bathroom and then she carried on as if nothing had happened. It is mind-boggling to think that Megan not only could commit homicide, but also keep it to herself and carry on with her life. The fact that Darren also never knew when she was pregnant or what was happening under their roof also blows my mind. But I've dealt with people on meth and being oblivious to life-changing circumstances is often a side effect. Megan continued in a home with domestic violence and drug abuse to raise her two daughters, and I was not even surprised when I discovered that once again she was pregnant. Again, with the fourth pregnancy, she told no one and hid it from the world. I suppose she could have been in total denial, but this was the fourth pregnancy, which she carried full term for nine months. This baby met its demise in the same way the previous one did. Once again, the little corpse was placed in a box, hidden in the garage, and afterwards... She cleaned up and carried on as if nothing significant happened. 
I understand the addiction, the depression, and the anxiety, but her behavior is now a pattern. It also did not just happen twice that she murdered her babies. Between the ages of 21 and 31 years old, Megan became pregnant repeatedly. Apart from one, she continued to hide the pregnancy, give birth alone, and then to kill the babies which she hid in the garage. The exception was when the baby was a stillborn. But I am convinced that if that baby had an ounce of life in it, Megan would have ended it. Another strange thing about this case is that twice during these births, there were other adults in the house. During one of the births, Megan was watching television with Darren and his brother when she just casually got up, told them that she was not feeling too well and was going to have a bath and go to bed early. What happened was she gave birth and then committed homicide. Giving birth is a painful procedure, and how she was not howling in pain is something I do not understand. Neighbors would wonder if she was pregnant, but since no new babies arrived at the house, they assumed that she had just gained weight. What worked to her advantage was the fact that she kept to herself and hardly ever left the house. Apparently, Darren did ask her a couple of times if she was pregnant, but she just denied it. The times when she was convinced she was pregnant, he would ask Megan what happened, and she would just lie and say she lost the baby. Still, even if she miscarried, the normal thing to do would be to go to a hospital for a DNC and to ensure everything with the woman is okay. But this never happened with Megan and Darren. He would later claim, after the truth came out, that he was addicted and messed up. So, over a period of ten years, as her first two daughters grew into teenagers, Megan continued her ritual of wrapping little babies' corpses in towels with electrical tape, placing them in rubbish bin bags, and building her own little mausoleum in the corner of the garage where people seemed to never go. In the year 2000, just after she killed her fourth baby, she had no choice but to keep the next baby. People were on to her with this pregnancy, and it was very clear she was pregnant. It was the only reason she kept the baby. No one has any idea what the dates of the murdered babies in the boxes were because Megan could care less than to keep track of the dates. Now Megan had three daughters, not because she wanted them, but because she was unable to hide the pregnancy. Despite a heavy meth addiction, this baby was born very healthy. For the next six years, she would continue her cycle of death and denial. By 2006, we can say with surety, she had murdered six of her infants and newborns. With the homemade coffin of the stillborn, it meant that there were at least seven dead babies in that garage. Because Darren was not only a meth user, but also a manufacturer and a dealer, the DEA had finally caught up with him, and he was arrested. They had been watching Darren's operation for a while, and arrived one day in full force to go through every nook and cranny of the house. As Darren was placed in cuffs, Megan was in a panic, because her dirty little secret was about to be exposed. Fortunately for her, the agents did not do such a good job, and Darren was sent to jail. He would be given a prison sentence of 12 years for the manufacturing and distribution of an illegal substance, while Megan was left to fend for herself and her three daughters. All I could think was that at least she would not be able to get pregnant. 
She was suddenly also without her regular supply of meth because her dealer and the father of her children was in prison. From the moment Darren went to prison, Megan began using less meth and more alcohol. Apart from drinking too much, without Darren, she seemed to be not only kicking the habit, but she was also not committing infanticide. She lived in the house that Darren's parents had gifted them, and they allowed her to remain in the house. The only condition was that while Darren was in prison, she had to remain faithful to him, which is what she did. For five years, this was the status quo, with Megan raising her three daughters in the house while the bodies of the infants gathered dust in the garage. All went well until 2011, when Megan was 36 years old. Her daughters were 18 years old, 17 years old, and 11 years old. Megan met a man by the name of Jimmy Brady, and despite the warnings she received from her in-laws, she began a relationship with him. Even though she was a master at keeping secrets, Darren's parents did find out about the relationship, and Megan was given notice that she needed to move out of the house. The three daughters were allowed to remain in the house with their aunt, but there was no mercy for Megan. She cheated, and she had to move. Megan moved in with Jimmy, and on the surface, it seemed that all was good. She still saw her girls on a regular basis, and the relationship she had with Jimmy seemed happier and healthier than the one she had with Darren. For two years, all seemed more stable than it had been in her adult life, until she discovered she was pregnant. This time, she did not hide the pregnancy, and she told Jimmy about the pregnancy. She was excited about having a baby with her new man. But Mother Nature is a cruel mistress, and she miscarried this fetus. There are those who speculate that she caused the miscarriage herself, but this was only a concern after her secret graveyard in the garage of the home where her daughters lived was revealed. All we know is that this baby was never carried to full term, and there is no evidence of the child anywhere. In 2014, Darren got paroled after serving eight years of his sentence. He returned to the home where his daughters had been living, and now that he had started his life over in the real world, he decided to do a massive spring cleaning. He eventually got to the garage and began to sort out the boxes and other miscellaneous items that had been put in the space. And that is how he discovered Megan's dirty little secret, or rather, her seven little cardboard coffins. He was curious, because the boxes were tightly wrapped in electrical tape, and he began opening the first box. He must have been horrified, and it must have taken him a moment to believe what he saw. But inside was the decayed remains of a tiny little baby. After the shock wore off a little, he first phoned the police to report his discovery, and then he phoned Megan to confront her about what he had found. Megan, who was not prepared for this moment, began to panic, and she told Darren that she had given birth to a stillborn and she did not know what to do. So, instead of going to the hospital, she decided to hide the birth. Darren then told her that the cops were on the way, and that is when Megan had a full-on panic attack. She ran to Jimmy and asked him for a gun to kill herself. Jimmy refused, and it did not take long before the police discovered the other dead babies and Megan was arrested and taken in for an interview. During the interview, they told Megan that 
they could see that at least one baby was stillborn. But they wanted to know what happened to the other six babies. Megan, realizing the game was up, decided to come clean and told the detectives about how she killed her babies. In her confession, she revealed everything she had done during the 10 years with Darren and the hidden pregnancies, although she could not say exactly how many times she had been pregnant. Due to her intense drug use during that time, her memory was not very good, but she told the detectives as much as she could remember. She even thought that there should be eight or nine babies in the garage, but the police only discovered the seven little bodies. During the autopsies, it was clear that she had killed six of the babies and even how she murdered them. One of the babies was even found with a hair tie around its neck. The most important question the police had for Megan was they wanted to know why she did it. Megan was very vague, but her main motive was that she believed that because of her meth addiction, she would not be able to take care of them. She never considered contraception, abortion, or adoption. She was charged with six counts of murder, and she was eligible for the death penalty. She had no defense and pled guilty, which led the judge to sentence her to 30 years to life. Chances are, however, that she will never be able to be released. Another similar shocking case is the case of Erica Murray in Blackstone, Massachusetts. In her case, it was not just murder, but incredible neglect that had her case make the headlines. When I first came across this case, I found it also unbelievable. But imagine you are a husband and a father, and one day you discover you not only have the children you know of, but under your roof, in a spare room, is a severely neglected three-year-old child and a six-month-old baby that is yours. Erica had given birth to these children, and she had chosen to lock them in a room and hide them away from the world. The conditions are horrendous to describe. They never went out, never were stimulated, and were hardly fed. Apart from the children, the only other object in the room was a mattress on the floor. The entire room looked as if it had been painted from floor to ceiling with shit stains. The children were completely nonverbal and obviously and obviously had never had a bath. Erica, who was born in 1983, had a normal and happy childhood. She grew up in Northridge, Massachusetts, and was a carefree and happy child. She had two brothers with whom she had a great relationship and was well taken care of by her parents, Kevin and Sharon. Kevin was very handy and a mechanic by profession, and Sharon was a housewife. The kids spent a lot of time outside, especially in the summer, and the close family took a lot of trips and went on vacations. She did well academically and had a close circle of friends. She took a lot of pride in her appearance, and everything about her childhood is the all-American kid's dream. Erica did, however, have an incredible fear of abandonment. No one to this day understands why, but she always had a fear of being judged and abandoned, especially by her family. When she was 16 years old, she got a part-time job with McDonald's, and very quickly, she got the attention of a much older man who also worked there, Raymond Rivera the third, who was seven years older which made the relationship very inappropriate. He pursued her with vigor, and soon they were dating. 
a year after they started dating, at the age of 17 years old, Erica fell pregnant. She was petrified about what her family and friends would think of her. So, she decided to hide the pregnancy. She did tell a close friend who accidentally let it slip one day at their home, and the secret was out. Her family was very supportive, but she did not want anyone at school to know and refused to go to her high school dance out of embarrassment. She did attend her graduation and shortly afterwards gave birth. Her parents even offered for Raymond to move in with them. Her parents offered so much assistance, and I must wonder if the age difference did not also contribute to their concern. For two years, the little family with baby Kayla lived a relatively domestic life with her parents. The one condition that Sharon and Kevin had was that she did not fall pregnant again. The couple were always struggling financially, and Erica had already begun so young to have children that they wanted her to wait. Well, guess what? She fell pregnant at the age of 20 years old. A baby boy was born by the name of Nicholas, and the entire little family moved into their own home. The house they moved into belonged to Raymond's sister, but it was vacant at the time. The three-bedroom house was at 23 St. Paul's Road in Blackstone. After moving into this house, Raymond's personality suddenly changed radically. Now that no one was watching him, he showed his true narcissistic side. She was completely dependent on him, and he controlled everything. He began to isolate her and convinced her to quit her job and stay at home. He was a typical abuser, and he began to verbally abuse her. He never physically abused her, but she was trapped in a home with an angry man who would humiliate her at every opportunity. He took complete financial control and ruled his household with fear. The effect was instant. She went from fashionable teenager to someone who hardly took a shower and never wore makeup in a handful of years. Her fear of abandonment had turned her into an almost depressed zombie, and Raymond knew if he wanted her to do anything, he should just threaten to leave her. He made one thing very clear. He did not want any more children. They could not afford it, and he would leave her if she did. Ironically, the two continued to have unprotected sex. Now, most of you didn't need a lecture on the birds and the bees to know what would happen if you did that. Erica knew Raymond's terms, but she also did not want to have the child aborted or adopted. Of all the wacky options in the world to deal with this problem, she decided to have the baby, keep it, and raise it in secret in the same house she shared with Raymond. She was so isolated and wore mostly baggy clothes, and eventually she convinced herself that she just might be able to get away with it. She carried to full term, and he never knew she was pregnant. Just like Megan, she gave birth to her baby in her bathroom alone. No medical attention for her or the baby was an option at this point. It's easy to hide an inanimate object, like a phone or remote control, but hiding a living, crying baby is no easy thing to do. They need constant care. In those first couple of months, all you try to do is to keep it alive and healthy. You don't even need to be a parent to know this, but Erica was convinced she could pull it off. She placed the baby in an upstairs room typically used for storage, and so began the neglect of the first of her children. Raymond did not notice the baby, and after a couple of weeks, 
Erica thought this was the perfect plan. When there was a noise from the child, Erica would tell her children and Raymond that she was babysitting for a friend. Despite his complete control of the house and its occupants, Raymond claims to have never suspected he had a child he was not aware of. This phase continued until Erica fell pregnant again, because that's what happens when you have unprotected sex. She was still wrapped in delusion and fear of abandonment, so she did what she did before. She hid the pregnancy and gave birth alone in the bathroom. The two children remained in that room until they were discovered. They were not potty trained, nor were they regularly changed. They were hardly fed and had no stimulation. To the outside world, it appeared that Erica led a normal life and was a normal mother. She might not have been able to have a real social life, but on Facebook, photos paint the picture of an average household with average kids and parents. In 2010, Kayla was 13 and Nicholas was 10 years old, and they featured a lot. Her secret children remained her secret for three years. If you knew about the secret children, the photos of them having parties and eating out is sickening. Raymond was working for Staples, but had begun growing and selling weed on the side. He was still being an abusive bastard to his wife, and one of Raymond's rules was that no one was ever allowed to visit their house. On the 27th of October, 2014, Erica and Kayla were out of the house for the whole day. She went to her neighbor, Betsy Brown, and asked her to keep an eye on Nicholas. The 13-year-old boy was friends with her son, Pete, so Betsy did not mind. Nicholas and Pete were playing outside when Betsy decided to go to the shop. While there, she got a phone call that would change the lives of everyone in her neighbor's house. When she picked up the call, her son was frantically shouting, We can't get the babies to stop crying! This was all he shouted repeatedly, which confused Betsy. She rushed home to find the boys were at Nicholas's home, and that there were indeed babies crying. When she arrived at the house, she found the two boys deeply distressed. She burst through the front door, and the first thing that hit her was the smell of shit. I am not talking about a dirty diaper kind of smell. It was a wall of stench that hit her right between the eyes. The house was also full of trash. Not a little, I mean heaps and mounds of discarded food containers and other rubbish. I am not describing the mess of a house that has been lived in. One of my sources described the devastation as if someone had gone to a landfill and transported truckloads of trash and just randomly dumped it in the house. Bugs, flies, and maggots feasted on rotten food, and shit was attracting even more insects. Betsy wanted to vomit, but she could hear small children crying, and she was a woman on a mission. She made her way up the stairs, and she could hear two children in two separate rooms screaming.
Both rooms had the same amount of trash the rest of the house held. To comfort the children, she covered the children and then she placed a call to 911. She explained to the best of her ability the discovery and explained that she did not want to touch the children because they might be hurt. She continued to softly talk to the children until the police arrived. Both children needed immediate medical attention and were rushed to the hospital. As the police fought through the foggy stench, they were amazed about the heaps of human waste that lay amongst the other debris. Dangerous objects were all over, and wires and wall sockets were exposed. Considering there were four children living in the house, this was an extremely concerning discovery. Raymond's weed operation, which he operated mainly from his basement, was quickly discovered. One of the rooms was so filled with trash, they struggled to open the door. In the room in which the five-month-old child was found, police also discovered a dead dog that had been there for some time. The cat and the dog that were still alive were also in bad shape and rescued. After being gone for eight hours, Erica returned. An officer approached her and asked her where she was, and she, in a deadpan face, told them she had things to do. CPS quickly removed the remaining children, to which Erica had no reaction. All she asked for was for the police to be careful because her cat was an indoor cat. At the police station, she calmly confirmed that all four children were her children and that Raymond was the father of all four. She told the police that Raymond did not know about the babies and she told them about his desire not to have any more children after the first two. She was asked for the names of the two babies, but Erica had never named them and referred to them as it. At the hospital, it was determined that both babies were suffering from malnutrition. They were extremely dirty, sensitive to sunlight, and had never been potty trained. Their skins were blistered, and maggots were found in their hair and ears. Neither child knew how to interact like a regular baby. They were terrified of people, and because the five-month-old baby had delayed movement, the back of her head was flat from never being picked up. The three-year-old could not walk, and she was unable to do basic things, like drinking from a cup. Neither had been ever bathed, and neither child knew how to communicate. Neither fortunately had any life-threatening conditions, but they were nonetheless in a very bad way. If anyone in the house asked about the sounds, Erica would say she was babysitting for a woman named Michelle Ridgway, whom she completely fabricated. She even made a Facebook page for her. The profile pic of this fake profile was Erica in a wig and glasses. Raymond did indeed know nothing, despite his controlling ways. How he did not know is still a mystery. He denied being the father, but a DNA test did confirm he was. He hardly ever went anywhere in the house except the basement, and the shock turned him into a crying heap. Erica, on the other hand, seemed unaffected. She was bailed out and continued posting on social media. People began digging into her posts and found she often posted her outrage about parents who were not good parents. On the 10th of September, 2014, police returned to the home. Conditions inside required they wear hazmat suits, and inside Kayla's closet, police discovered two boxes 
with blood-soaked covers. Both contained the skeletal remains of babies in worm seeds, with a full head of hair and another skeleton of a dead dog. In Nicholas's closet, there was another baby corpse, but this one still had its umbilical cord on and was naked. This baby was found in a backpack, and tests would later reveal that all three were born alive, and the oldest had survived and the oldest had survived till the age of one month old. Erica and Raymond were arrested. Erica was charged with the murder of two babies and the concealment of death of the third baby, injuries to a child, two counts of reckless endangerment of a child, two counts of animal cruelty, and Raymond was charged with animal cruelty, causing substantial danger to a child, two counts of assault and battery on a child, and with the weed growing operation. Both were held in jail for the five years it took for the case to go to trial. In June 2019, Erica's defense was mental illness and spousal abuse and diminished capacity to think. She suffered from depression, and obviously psychologists found that she did not want to deal with prison. Prosecutors shut that defense down. She was smart enough to create a fake social media profile. She was, however, not found guilty for the murders of her two little infants, but was found guilty for all the other charges. Raymond was found guilty of all his charges. Raymond received four and a half years, but was released for the time he had served. Erica was sentenced to six to eight years. Considering she served five years already, it's safe to assume she has already been released. Erica and Raymond's house was demolished because the state of the dwelling was not deemed livable for humans. The two older children were sent to live with one of the grandparents, and by all accounts, are doing very well. It's easy to forget that these two children also lived in the squalor that the couple called home. The two younger children were absorbed into foster care after they were released from hospital. The three-year-old had learned to walk after only two weeks in foster care, and her improvement had been dramatic. Not much is known about how the baby is doing, but whatever her condition is, it could not possibly be as bad as it was with their birth parents. These two cases have so many similar themes with domestic violence and substance abuse only being two. In the true crime world, we often keep on repeating the mantra, see something, say something. But Erica and Megan's cases show that sometimes you must trust your sixth sense. In none of these cases, neglect, abuse, or even murder was obvious, but people felt that something was not quite right. Perhaps we've become too accustomed to not intervening. Our own lives often hold enough challenges to keep us busy. But I think if you feel in your gut something involving, especially a child, is wrong, you should at least probe a little. If you don't, it might make you culpable. This episode was written by Penny Morris. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.